and I share my entire screen. Okay. So now uh, we will start discussing the introduction to hypersonic flow. Um, okay. So uh, we have already studied the basic fluid mechanics, aerodynamics, compressible flow, computational fluid dynamics, and now I think we will have a discussion on the hypersonic flow, right? So, uh, in this particular uh, slide, or in the first course, uh, we will discuss the, we will have a brief description of hypersonic flow, and uh, the proper definition of a hypersonic flow, right? And then, um, we will have a comparison between uh, supersonic and the hypersonic vehicle design. And then the physical characteristics of the hypersonic flow we will discuss. Um, I assume that you already have an experience in aerodynamic design of aircraft, where some of you have just started with the uh, passenger airplane and some started with the fighter airplane. Uh, and they are all playing in a different flow regimes like subsonic, transonic, supersonic and you know hypersonic flow. So you may have some imagination on how subsonic airplane looks like, how supersonic airplane looks like and how hypersonic airplane looks like, right? Um, with that basic information, I will enter into the uh, introduction. Uh, so, in this introduction, the text which we follow is uh, hypersonic and high temperature gas dynamics. Uh, now the third edition is already released, but um, mm -hmm. we can follow the second edition also because it is available in the library. Um, uh, so, we will follow Anderson, right? Uh, you have already experience on following John D. Anderson, right? So, John D. Anderson's uh, writing, you are already, you know, you have already read John D. Anderson and you are used to his wordings. So, I follow the same John D. Anderson for high temperature, uh, hypersonic and high temperature gas dynamics here. And uh, you know John D. Anderson, um, from uh, he is uh, now from the National Air and Space Museum and, uh, you know, Smithsonian Institution, Washington. and. Uh, he was a professor emeritus in the uh, University of Maryland. And you know very well that from the introduction to aerospace engineering, uh, we have started with the introduction flight by John D. Anderson. And then we have studied the basic elementary flows and the incompressible theoretical flow uh, from fundamentals of aerodynamics by John D. Anderson. And then we come back to the compressible flow where you have studied the uh, shock theory uh, normal shock, oblique shock, and all those things in uh, modern compressible flow. And we have a aircraft performance course where you have studied about the, you know, takeoff, uh, cruising, level flight, descending, landing, and, you know, various performance, including the banking and all those things. Uh, then computational fluid dynamics by John D. Anderson you have studied. And you have studied about the various turbulence model, how to approximate a fluid flow, right? Now we come back to, again, Anderson with the hypersonic and high temperature gas dynamics. So I follow hypersonic and high temperature gas dynamics by John D. Anderson because you already have an experience with the reading Anderson. Okay, let me start the, uh, you know, some brief about the hypersonic flow. Um, it is like said by P.L. Rowe of the Own Kerman Institute, Belgium, one of the famous institute for fluid dynamics in the world. Uh, he said almost everyone has their own definition of the term hypersonic. So, in general, if we conduct a public opinion poll um, and ask them, the Mach number above which we can say that is a hypersonic flow, uh, the majority of the people may say 5, 6, right? May say 5, 6. 
but it would be quite possible for someone to advocate and defend the Mac numbers as small as 3 or as high as 12. Um, we have already a, a supersonic flow regime. So we generally say supersonic flow regime is more than Mach number 1. Uh, now the question comes here, right? So if the supersonic uh, flow is more than Mach number 1, uh, how come uh, how come we can uh, have a hypersonic flow again, right? So we will answer that question a little later. But now, uh, before going into that, we will have some discussion on hypersonic, right? So uh, hypersonic aerodynamics is uh, really different than the conventional and experienced regime of the supersonic aerodynamics. We already have an experience of subsonic flight. Most of your uh, airplane design, uh, airplane performance, stability and control, you might have studied about the um, subsonic, right? subsonic design. You will be having a very big wing uh, with a very you know, higher span area, uh, aspect ratio, and you have a big uh, fuselage uh, to accommodate the passenger as well as the cargo. And uh, you know you have an engine, separate engine, two engine, four engine, and so on. And you have a control surfaces um, like aileron, elevator, nicely designed. And we can imagine what it is in the subsonic flow. Um, in the supersonic flow, we again have some information like a sharp needle-like nose. Correct? I can show this diagram, right? Sharp needle-like nose and the slender fuselage and you know very thin wings and the tail surfaces uh, with a sharp leading edge right and with a very low aspect ratio for the straight wing itself right um, all these design is because uh, we should uh, reduce the wave drag in in the in the subsonic regime we encounter only the skin friction drag, pressure drag, and the induced drag. But in the supersonic flow regime, we know that more than Mach number one have a formation of shock wave. And shock wave in turn generates a wave drag, and hence we need to consider that for the design. Right? Now uh, supersonic airplane we know, subsonic airplane we know. Now, how to design a hypersonic airplane? So, hypersonic vehicle design, it will be always tempting you know, to utilize the same same design or similar design of the supersonic, right? So, I, I remember uh, uh, during my interview for a master's program in uh, MIT Chennai. Um, there was a, a group of professors there and uh, you know I made a proposal uh, to study the hypersonic airplane aerodynamic characteristics at the low speed. It was like you know the thinking in such a way for my master's research is like an airplane which can take off from the ground, go to the orbit and drop the satellites wherever the orbit we want and then come back so in this particular type of airplane the airplane need to take off from ground but we have an issue considering the supersonic and hypersonic airplane having a very small aspect ratio and you know low wing area taking off from the ground is not so simple so um, we have a proposal like you know how we can do that like variable area wing and all those things but so i went there for the interview under the professors there are some six seven professors were there in the committee and uh, uh, they asked many questions i have answered uh, reasonably well and uh, then one, one, one of the professors started asking uh, okay fine so you tell me what is hypersonic flow? Then I told uh, hypersonic flow is a flow where the Mach number is more than 5 or 6. No, oh, that is Mach number. Tell me what is hypersonic flow. That is a question. 
when we can say the flow is hypersonic. Uh, then I said, uh, uh, Professor, we need to design nicely, right? I mean, then the MIT, when uh, they call for an interview, you know what they do? Seven or six professors will be there. And when one professor complete, uh, completed asking the question, then he look into the another professor and he will start. Like that, you know, all the professor, uh, they ask the question and it will be very complicated. I cannot say that, um, you know, how different it is. But the question, they were keep on asking. I was saying the vehicle will have a sharp nose, blunt nose and all those things. But they were asking, no, no, tell me what is hypersonic flow. Because when we were students in uh, 2002 and all, there was no course on hypersonic flow. Hypersonic flow was not very famous even in uh, the premier institutions in India at that time. Then I started, okay, we will study. Then they said, that, okay, everything is fine, you can uh, join. But you should uh, go through the hypersonics and the physical phenomena. Then I was uh, studying about the hypersonic flow later and then I understand my definition is a mere rule of thumb by considering Mach number more than 5 or 6 is hypersonic. We will come back. We will have a discussion on that. Right. So um, this is a hypersonic airplane, a supersonic airplane uh, designed in 1950s. And you know, Dark and Carmen from NASA, at that time it was called the NACA, uh, they also designed the proposal. Uh, they made a proposal for hypersonic in 1953. You know, it is almost similar like a supersonic aircraft. You see the difference? almost similar right then in 1963 Boeing proposed the X-20 aircraft but in the 10 year the knowledge on hypersonic was entirely different and you can see the different design sharp nose blunt nose and you know the various other controls control system and everything is different so the complete looking of this particular aircraft, um, you know, in 1953 and 1963, it is entirely different. So, sharp in, a, in a extended design, utilized a sharp swift delta wing, but with a blunt rounded leading in. I will come back to why they have considered blunt, but this was the history, right? So, rather uh, thick fuselage with the rounded nose. And then the fuselage was placed on the top of the wing uh, so that the entire under surface of the vehicle was flat. Maybe the question like why it need to be flat, that we will come back. Because it is not simply an uh, aircraft, but it should be engine, airframe, integrated design. So then it was uh, intended to uh, experiment uh, using a rocket powered flight at Mach number 20. Uh, but somehow, uh, such uh, X20 was not developed very nicely uh, to a commercial aspect, but the similar design was utilized in the later stage. So hypersonic vehicles are different configuration from supersonic vehicles, and hence we might conclude that the hypersonic aerodynamics is different from supersonic airplane, supersonic aerodynamics. Uh, at this point, we have some information on the design from the previous experience, and we can say that. The hypersonic aerodynamics is different from the supersonic aerodynamics. Uh, even though the X-20 was not really utilized, but that particular design was, um, you know, considered in the space shuttle and all. And later, over a period of time, people say that the re-entry vehicle, atmospheric re-entry vehicle of Apollo space, you see, it is very much blunt, right? So there are a lot of research on uh, re-entry vehicle um, by considering very much blunt surface, right? blunt leading it. Now, uh, this is a, a single stage to orbit vehicle, right? Uh, we have uh, this particular vehicle and, uh, you know, once there was a big competition for single stage to orbit vehicle and the two stage to orbit vehicle. But the good point is hypersonic research was really very active. So um, we can say that now we have achieved um, 
a success in the unmanned hypersonic flight. Maybe the duration is very small, right? But we have achieved the hypersonic flight based on both the phenomena and by considering the rule of thumb of particular Mach number. So the era of uh, practical hypersonic flight is still ahead of us and it poses uh, challenges to the aerodynamics. Right? So let us see some of the idea of modern hypersonic flight. So I will give a small introduction of such hypersonic vehicle. Uh, I remember that I gave some small introduction sometimes back in the previous years and some group of students they came forward and they have done uh, work on hypersonic vehicle computationally because uh, in our supersonic wind tunnel we can do um, the experiment till Mach number 3 or 3.5. So they have done it computationally and they have published in the uh, science citation index to journal with impact factor 2.25. I mean, there are some two, three groups they have already done. And the previous badge also, uh, there was some group they are doing the hypersonic vehicle and I think some of you might have helped. So, um, the idea is like, um, it should be like something like a air breathing hypersonic vehicle. Right? So, the one of the and ideally uh, takes off horizontally from the ground in the runway and accelerate into orbit around the earth and then it is fully powered by most of the part is powered by scramjet engine and uh, most likely a rocket to assist for the final uh, insertion into the orbit so it will subsequently carry out a mission in the orbit or uh, within the outer region of the atmosphere and re-enter into the atmosphere at Mach number 25 and finally the power on conventional runway. This is almost, uh, I remember this kind of a vehicle uh, is like, you know, a reusable launch vehicle, kind of. You know, a reusable launch vehicle in the sense, um, when we have, a, you know, when we launch uh, from the, uh, uh, don't uh, say about the um, the programs by uh, HyperX group that they you know launch and their launch vehicle come and uh, uh, place in the same uh, same uh, uh, launch pad or something like that. But this is something like an airplane takes off from the ground and go to the orbit, do whatever performance they want, and then come back. But coming back into the Earth's atmosphere is not so simple, right? So. The recent success in X43 HyperX unmanned research vehicle, which possesses such a design, right? So it is like a sustained flight has been achieved for Mach number 10 for a period of 10 seconds with a scramjet engine. Right? So this is a simple uh, uh, pictorial view, and this is a three dimensional view of X43 uh, HyperX fixed vehicle. Fixed vehicle. Uh, the good point is now not only the prediction based on wind tunnel study, but also the computational fluid dynamics study. Say, for example, I told some of the three uh, previous badges want to do work on hypersonic flow, hypersonic design, but they cannot do it in the wind tunnel, and hence they utilized the computational fluid dynamics. We have done a good job, and uh, you know, one paper was published in uh, 2017 in Acta Astronautica. And another paper in the Chinese Journal of Aeronautics, and now another Actas Phonetica paper we are communicating. So, uh, the potential of utilizing the computational fluid dynamics and utilizing the computational fluid dynamic data is uh, very interesting, very useful, right? So, this is uh, the um, generic uh, representation of two stage to orbit vehicle, right? So, um, we believe that sometimes in 21st century, uh, you know, after all the development we can uh, see through sky carrying the passenger and the cargo at Mach number 5 or larger, right? Um, it is like, it is a conceptually, uh, we have that plan and there are a lot of laboratories, they are started working on um, such a uh, mission, right? 
the technical uh, economic and the environmental challenges is uh, right, like really enormous but um, i am sure that it will happen right i wrote but it will not uh, happen uh, you know it it means like you know there was a there was a issue there are many people they think that it will not happen but since we have a very successful supersonic flight hypersonic flight with the passenger is also possible and we will see that right so general assumption and generally uh, the uh, people who are uh, you know not talking deep into the aerodynamics they think that it is very difficult but they say it will not happen because they have a various reason i will tell you that reason there, sh- there are lot of physical phenomena experienced by the hypersonic vehicles um, right so i we will discuss that like the shock layer and you know thin shock layer the entropy layer um, high temperature and uh, low density high density ratio um, and uh, you know at uh, you know flying at a very high speed uh, we have you know ionization of uh, the air molecules happens and that in turn uh, stops the communication between the vehicle and the ground like that they say a lot of reason but we always find a reason for how it works how can we make that work for a hypersonic flow right hypersonic vehicle now um it is important to mention uh, here the aspects of the hypersonic atmospheric vehicles from the conventional subsonic and supersonic airplane design right um we know in a subsonic or supersonic design we have the uh, the components like lift which produces um you know which is produced by wings uh, propulsion by you know engine and nacelle and uh, the accommodation of passenger as well as the cargo um, is in the fuselage and the one thing is like we can say that these components are really different right these components are uh, considered as a different components and we can address but in the case of uh, hypersonic flow it is not so right so in the hypersonic flow the air frame and the engine are integrated right so uh, like we had as uh, you know so we had a comparison like interaction between these all uh, you know the production and the something which produces a lift the propulsion accommodation and we have a interaction between all these components but in the case of uh, hypersonic flow hypersonic vehicle design the engine and the airframe will be a integrated part right so this is what the conceptual transport aircraft john d anderson say that this kind of airplane will fly right fly soon that is what the is expectation so in the modern hypersonic aerodynamic design see this is a integrated airframe propulsion uh, concept for the hypersonic airplane where the entire Uh, under surface of the vehicle is a part of scramjet right and this is a cross section taken and you can see uh, the cross section where there are engine modules and all those so this hypersonic vehicle uh, integrated with the scramjet and usually the initial compression of the air takes place uh, through the bow shock formation uh, from the nose of the aircraft and then the further compression and the supersonic compression takes place uh, inside the series of modules arranged which i have shown here right and then the expansion of the burned gas is partially released through the nozzles in the engine modules uh, but mainly over the bottom rear surface of the aircraft which is sculptured with a nozzle like shape so the propulsion mechanism is intimately integrated with the airframe is the beauty of the hypersonic design here the the usually we consider wing as a lifting surface but here the concept is different so most of the lift is produced by high pressure behind the bow shock and exerted on the relatively flat under surface of the vehicle 
So I, I remember in this case, um, the whole body or a four body will be acting as a lifting circuit, not exactly the wing. So I remember we have modified the four body of the hypersonic vehicle and uh, to a certain extent we have done some work on uh, how can we utilize the four body of the hypersonic body as a lifting circuit. Right? Then the use of large distinct wings is not necessary for the production of high lift. Uh, finally, the fuel what we use uh, is like a liquid hydrogen which occupies a large volume. So this is what the comparison between uh, the general supersonic, subsonic and the hypersonic vehicle, right? So all of these consideration combined in a hypersonic vehicle um, in such a fashion that the components generate lift, propulsion and the volume are not separate from each other, rather they are closely integrated in the same overall lifting shape and in direct contrast to conventional subsonic and supersonic vehicles. Right? So this way we can have an imagination that hypersonic flow is special. Right? Because the design is different, the phenomena is different. Now we can have some information why we differentiate supersonic and hypersonic. Right? So hypersonic flow, why it is so important? Uh, we can have the answer that it is physically different from supersonic flow. Right? Um, then we can say that there are new exciting designs um, in the 21st century. And hence, uh, we can, uh, you know, we need to consider the uh, hypersonic flow, hypersonic flow, hypersonic vehicle design. Right. Okay, then come back to the characteristics of hypersonic flow. I am not going to discuss uh, the uh, individual characteristics deeply, but uh, I want to say because keep on saying that the phenomena or uh, physical. Uh, physical aspects of the supersonic and hypersonic flow is different and hence we need to uh, uh, show this particular slide right because you may think that the design aspect is different we can uh, agree now but how can we say that the basic the physical phenomena is different so if you consider a hypersonic vehicle and we have a phenomena called thin shock layer uh, thin shock layer we say that because of the high Mach number, the formation of shock, and the, you know the shock angle will be keep on decreasing when compared to the wedge angle, and hence the shock layer becomes thin. Similarly, entropy layer um, inside the shock, near the nose and uh, away from the nose, we can say that the uh, entropy, the change in the entropy that induces a vortex, correct? So that we will uh, have a discussion. Right? Then uh, viscous interaction, right? So because of the shock wave attached to the surface, um, there is a high temperature. When there is a high temperature, uh, the viscosity changes. And when the viscosity changes, the gas expands. And hence, uh, it creates an interaction the viscous interaction to the outer air layer and hence the viscous interaction becomes an important one. High temperature uh, flows, right? I will tell you how much high temperature is like, you know, 9000, 10,000 Kelvin, where the air dissociates into ions, right? So such a consideration is necessary. Then the low density flows. When the airplane flies at a very high uh, altitude or so, right, the density becomes low, and we will have a discussion on all these characteristics of the hypersonic flow. Right? I stop at this point for this class. Um, thank you, and we can uh, uh, go for uh, any discussion. Uh,